So, good evening, friends. Uh, welcome to CSDS. Uh, as you know, we are gathered here to celebrate a wonderful book, English Life. The book is here, book is outside. Have a look. Uh, there are many good things about this book. Uh, I'll leave it to Professor Sini to tell you about that. One great thing that I can mention is that four of the essays in this book were first published in Hindi before being translated into English. So that's quite rare in, in our collections, which is usually the other way around. So I'm very happy that Ravikant and Professor Sini managed to find these essays and have them translated. Uh, I'm also very happy that both our editors, uh, Francesca and Ravikant, hopefully very soon, will be here in person. Uh, it's, it's okay to have people on Zoom, but nothing like having you in this room in person, both for the talk and hopefully for the conversations afterwards. Uh, we have a wonderful panel, uh, Professor Aisha Kidwai, uh, Avinash Tas, Trisha Gupta. Uh, I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, there's only one note of regret. Uh, the official chairperson for this event, uh, Dr. Badik Bharacharya can't be with us today. So I'm standing in his place. So bear with me for a little more time. I'll just introduce the speakers and then move on. And then Professor Sini can conduct the proceedings. Uh, uh, as far as uh, Professor Sini herself goes, uh, very briefly, she needs very little introduction. She did her PhD from SOAS. She's also studied in India at Central Institute of Hindi and at JNU, author of numerous books and co-editor of numerous others, most famously Print and Pleasure 2009. But the reason we are celebrating today is to celebrate this latest co-edited volume, English Life. Uh, professor Asa Kidwai is a professor of linguistics at JNU. She has been a visiting professor at several leading universities in Europe and USA and was awarded the Infosys Prize in 2013 for her exceptional contribution to the field of theoretical linguistics. She serves on the editorial board of several publications, is the author of several books, not only on linguistics, but a wonderful translator of two volumes in Freedom's Shade, which is a translation of Azadi Kichame, and more recently, Dust of the Caravan. Professor Trisha Gupta, old friend, colleague, now a professor of practice at Jinder School of Communication, Journalism and Communication. Uh, she's the historian and anthropologist, did a BA from Stephens and then go, went on to do an MA from Cambridge, Namefield from Columbia University. She has held positions at Time Out, uh, Time Out Delhi, Tehelka, Biblio, and is currently working on her first non-fiction book. Uh, our final speaker this evening is Avinash Das, another Kumar. old friend, Avinash Kumar, <laughs> another old friend and colleague, uh, PhD in history from JNU, where he worked on politics of Hindi literature in early 20th century, was a Charles Wallace postdoctoral fellow at SOAS and has taught at Mahatma Gandhi Hindi University, Vardha. Uh, he's also worked earlier with us in collaboration at Sarai program, and since then was working in the field of development where he worked with Oxfam, WaterAid, and other institutions. At the moment, his, his last full-time position was as executive director of Amnesty International India, and is currently honorary fellow at the Center for Equity Studies. So our speakers are there, and the sequence of proceedings would be, I would invite Professor Sini to speak about the book uh, a little bit for 10, 12, 15 minutes, up to you. Uh, followed by Professor Kidwai and then Trisha and Avinash. After that, we'll take questions. Kitab Angrezi mein hai. Sawal Angrezi ya Hindi jis mein poochna chahe na. Pooch sakte hai. Thank you. Namaskar, sabka swagat hai. Thank you, Aisha, ki aap hamari beech mein hai. To, um, मैं वैसे अमूमन या तो हिंदी या तो अंग्रेजी में बोलती हूँ इंग्लिश में कभी-कभी बीच में आ जाती है तो so and Ravikant well will be here so this book we see this book very much as a kind of continuation of uh, chutneyfying 
English by Rita, edited by Rita Kotari and uh, Rupert Snell. Um, and, and they are in a way, um, I think the first books that take, first books that take um, the phenomenon of English uh, kind of seriously uh, and not just uh, sort of um, take positions uh, about it. So of why English? So I want to just uh, make uh, three or four points about the book and, and hopefully introduce as many of the, um, uh, of the chapters and writers uh, who are some of them here, in fact, and maybe can intervene and make their own points. Uh, Akriti and Vinit uh, are here. So, of course, language switching and mixed codes are not at all unusual. Uh, they're very common in, or surprising in, in, in when, when there are individuals and groups with varying linguistic competence and, and a kind of very hetero heterogeneous uh, society. So nor is, it, nor is it a new phenomenon. Uh, so if we look back and uh, in Chatnifying English, you know, Harish Trivedi in the introduction gave some examples from Akbar Ilahabadi or from Roger Kipling. No? So there is a long tradition of, um, of mixing uh, that we could call um, English in the colonial context zone. But of course, you know, we can think of even earlier. So what's new about it and why are we talking about it as if as a new language? Um, is there a sort of qualitative change or is it a quantitative change? You know, just more and more of it and more and more of it in, uh, in a whole range of spaces uh, where perhaps uh, it wasn't so present before. And I think we, we take in the book, the defi uh, Aisha's definition of English not as a language, but as an umbrella term for a set of vital practices, as she puts it, that are socially and politically significant. Uh, so not an umbrella term for a set of practices that are actually quite different, done by different people in different um, locations and social locations, but also significant that all these you know, different practices have now kind of coalesced under a name, uh, that we give a name English to all of them. And I think what we agree also is that there's been a change from what we say tolerance, uh, so that, you know, English is a part of life, uh, I actually in everyday language a lot, and it's just tolerated, maybe frowned upon, to a clear preference for it, uh, particularly, of course, in advertising, uh, where, as Santosh Desai says, we don't even call it English anymore, uh, basically. Uh, mixing has become the language of advertising, whether visually or linguistically or in terms of scripts and so on. Although, of course, in Hindi, we often hear criticism that there's too much of it. Huh? Uh, there's too much. Some of it is okay, but too much. And uh, Ravira Klam, in one of the images of the book, shows a, a, an, art, a, an article from, uh, I can't remember which news, Hindi newspaper, with all the English, um, um, if, you, if you open it and see, with all the English words um, sort of circled, and basically it's the whole article. No? So like there's the idea that, that there's too much of it. And Rohit Prakash's uh, essay, which appeared in Hindi first, is about the Navhara times, you know, the, and the perception that English in Navhara times is too much of it. Huh? It's like uh, forced. Huh? It's not just reproducing a language that is there, but forcing a particular kind of mixture. Um, and of course, uh, your own Abhay uh, Dube in a conference, in a workshop that we had at, uh, here um, years, some years ago, you know, attack, you know, voice the very common uh, perception in Hindi of English as a Trojan horse huh? of English who is used to come, you know, who will to come and subdue and conquer and hollow out Hindi. And I think it's a, you know, it's not an unusual um, perception. So what's the difference? Huh? So why English and what's the difference? So unlike all the many loan, unmarked loan works like school, is school, is station, transfer in Hindi or Gerao, Pakka, Jugar, in English, no, in, English for us involves a conscious accenting. Uh, it's almost like putting inverted commas, quotation marks around words and phrases, drawing attention to the particular way in which they're spoken and the meaning, uh, so often ironic, often citational, often quoting something else. Uh, that they are meant to convey in that situation. And as in fact, several of the essays, uh, for example, Akshay Kumar's on Bhujpuri, 
um, cinema uh, or uh, Ratnakar Tripathi as well. Um, the idea, and, and Rita Kotari made the point also uh, in her um, comments that it's not just a relationship or a mixing between Hindi and English, but also with the regional bullies in, in them. Uh, so, and as Akshay Kumar's chapter shows, this mixing there can make can carry, in fact, quite different meeting, meanings. You know? So if we think of English in Delhi as being aspirational, Bhojpuri English mixing, uh, he, which he calls the lateralness of Bhojpuri, uh, and I'm quoting him, he says, it's a scandalizing imperative to disrupt the reigning order. Uh, so actually, mixing there has a very different meaning. My second point, so what, why English? What is English? The second point, and this is one of the one of the key questions of Chatnifying English. The earlier book was: Is this a unifying force? Uh, is it something that is breaking down the barriers between Hindi and English, which, of course, you know, are seen very much as you know uh, hierarchical and uh, antagonistic, as being, you know representing different social uh, constituencies, or does it reveal and reproduce social hierarchy? as language tends to do, huh? that as soon as you open your mouth and say something, you know, it'd be clear who you are, where you're coming from, how well you speak a language, and so on and so forth. So English, does English, you know, um, um, diminish or, or sort of transcend these divisions, or does it just reproduce them? And in, our, in the various chapters of our book, we found that, the, you know, we don't give a sim single answer. I don't think there is a single answer, in fact. But we want to rather explore, we wanted to explore what mixing does and what does it mean uh, in a variety of contexts. So technology, uh, Ravirat Lamy, media, in, in, and very differently in different. So newspaper versus politics <coughs> and radio vignettes essay versus film, uh, Rachel Dwyer and uh, Helen Ashton, versus reality TV, uh, Mo Mo Mohini Gupta's article, and advertising with Santosh Desai, language training, uh, English training by Sazana Jayadeva, and so on. So I think we, 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 we sort of um, go more towards the stratified, but we register that the discourse is often that of unifying. Accent. Uh, so I think what we what we probably introduce compared to the chatifying English book is an attention to accent, accent and accenting. So not just simply languages, but how they are spoken, both individually as a, as a conscious choice, as we said, accenting, but also accent. You know, in fact, I think we introduce more. You know, rather than some kind of standard Hindi and standard English, we think of you know the various varieties of Indian English and English accents in there. And of course, accent is a big part of how um, language conveys social stratification. Um, and Mohini, in Mo, through Mohini Gupta's article, uh, chapter on the reality shows, MTV Roadies and Big Boss, for example, we can also even speak of language passing, eh? like caste passing, eh? where, you are, where speakers perform linguistic acts to in order to be perceived as belonging to a different social category. Uh, after all, that's one of the things you can do with language. And then, as she shows, you know, the, the compares often mock contestants. Uh, they, they prod and says, oh, but that doesn't seem like your accent. Are you putting on? And that becomes a way of saying, are you pretending to be somebody you are not? While, of course, language is a very big part of uh, and language training of, of trying to become somebody else. Um, and in fact, several chapters in the book discuss accents. So interestingly, Sazana Jaydeva's uh, chapter on English Coaching Institute in Bangalore, um, you know, it's, uh, she notes how accent is very important, but it's not in terms of arriving at some kind of unmarked or some kind of, you know, high English British accent or international accent at all. Uh, it's really rather good English is about um, using an accent that is commensurate, that is uh, right for the situation you're in. Uh, so it's a really interesting, um, really interesting argument and, and, uh, and, and chapter. In, in my chapter on uh, Anuja Chohan's novel, The Zoya Factor, um, I, th I think of Zoya as the good English speaker. Uh, and what, who is the good English speaker? Somebody who has 
the broadest range of competence. So not one, uh, not particularly one, but can do the whole range. Uh, uh, and is able both to get the subtle meanings of every code and register, but also to modulate her performance to that particular interaction or, um, or situation. Interestingly said, by, by contrast, um, the chapter by Rachel Dwyer and Helen Ashton on uh, accent in Hindi, in Hindi films, uh, and they examined a close reading of Yash Chopra's Jabta Kajan. Um, so Helen, and Helen Ashton herself is an accent coach, so she has a real you know, professional ability to, um, to detect and analyze accent. So they show that even in a film like that, where accent in a way is part of the story and very much part of the characterization, um, the actor's accent very constantly within the, within the film. And, and the argument they, pre they, they present, they give is that um, in Hindi films, the star's voice uh, and the star's accent is more important and in interferes in the character's accent. So that these, the, the star, the actor come in and out and in and out of the character because the, the viewers want to hear, you know, Shah Rukh's voice. They don't want to hear, they want to hear that character voice, but they also want to hear their voice, uh, his voice. <coughs> My last point uh, is about the value of English. Uh, and I think this is something that both, both um, Santosh Desai as well as Vinit talk about. Uh, so um, Santosh uh, Desai has this wonderful phrase, English makes language valuable. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a phrase that encapsulates how the rise of English is connected intimately to the boom in consumer goods, services, media, and so on, after the liberalization of the 1990s. And, and Vinit talks about you know, the, the value that English um, political advertorials, uh, so political advertising or political speech that, um, that tries to hide the fact that it's advertising, uh, on FM radio is also very valuable. Mm? And he shows you know, the huge increase in, uh, in the um, budget for radio adverts uh, over the last uh, two elections. So he English, work, English works so well in advertising, Santosh Desar shows, because it's a very deliberate uh, uh, language. The language of advertising is very deliberate, as is English there, and it's compressed language. Um, and if English, and this is another, instead I draw here on Paromita Vohra, who took part in our workshops, uh, she says, if English itself represents some kind of creative libidinality, uh, meaning this sort of desire, it has to do with desire, uh, and some, some kind of creative desire, it seems to me that, that the, it seems to us that the financial value of English lies in the way in which it can, you know, even in Mera Nambar Kabaiga, uh, uh, or um, mange more. Huh? So just a, a short phrase that can encapsulate um, a whole range of emotions, desires, aspirations, and can sell almost everything huh? from fun to, new to a new identity. And in fact, uh, Santosh Desai ends up by saying, well, English now is not used to particularly necessarily to, you know, to speak of um, or to convey the desire for aspiration or for family or for this or for that, but it's a multi-utility device. It can be used for basically for anything. Sorry, Akriti, I haven't talked about your chapter, but maybe you can talk about your chapter later. So to, so the discourse and, and, and coming back to why we did this project and why we did this book, um, I mean, we wanted to have a, make an intervention in the in the way in which language is talked about you know, in India, which is often a very fraught way, you know, about kema. Huh? Are you in this kema or in that kema? If you're a Hindi, Bali, then you will be against English, naturally. You know, whatever you say uh, is already interpreted in that way, uh, or, or the opposite. You know? Whereas, of course, a lot of people have you know, a fit in, in both or, or more languages. So it's not why should it be necessarily a question about you know, um, only hierarchy or only cho choosing or um, only climbing up the language ladder and, and letting the you know, so-called lower languages uh, drop away? Um, 
So the discourse around language in India is very fraught, usually, and English, of course, is not a, no exception. So, you know, if you look at English news media, English tends to be, you know, praised very enthusiastically. It's a sort of celebration about, you know, this sort of transcending the boundaries between Hindi and English. Whereas, as I said, in Hindi voices are often very critical. It's a kind of about an erosion huh, of competence in Hindi and erosion of respect for, for Hindi and other, uh, and other regional languages. And I think we all share the concern about, you know, uh, you know, if you read Sazana Jaidev or, or Mohini Gupta's chapters about, you know, language humiliation or the lack of respect for somebody who can be very proficient, but only in, you know, Hindi or Telugu or Kannada or, um, or Marathi, you know, is not, not perceived to be good enough. So we, of course, we about that and we are appalled at the idea that at the, what you know, some of the um, speakers in um, that Sazana talks to who speak of their Canada education or their Canada proficiency as an English handicap. Huh? So it's a handicap that they have and that they have to try and overcome um, by learning English but also by changing themselves basically huh? and, uh, and dropping Canada. But we also take the view that English in, in its many forms is very much part and often a creative and fun part of everyday life. And that policing everyday language, so saying, you know, too much, we shouldn't do it, you know, only this much uh, is never a good thing. And also is, as Ravi Khan would put it, an, an enterprise that is doomed to fail. Huh? So let's not think about Hindi and English in this kind of, you know, normative way that this much is fine, here is okay, but not there, but sort of try and understand the many meanings uh, that it carries. Thank you, that's my bit. Question about Sazana Jaydev. Uh, Sazana Jaydev is a Professor Kidwai, can you please? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. And I don't see uh, that we can't, but um, so usually when linguists uh, are asked to um, look at or when they encounter the writing of people who are not linguists uh, on linguistic phenomena, we're usually quite gloomy and quite sulky because what we expect to see uh, is uh, some fundamental confusions. We are a small group of people. This is how we uh, feel important uh, that we, we, we have some greater knowledge. But in fact, I think uh, that this book is one of the most important contributions uh, to what linguists should be doing. And <clears throat> it's also an affirmation of the fact that linguists can talk to um, non linguists and then be enriched by them. <clears throat> so what this book does, it's a major contribution, I think, to the study of code mixing in a um, multilingual society <clears throat> and mapping the various meanings, um, the social meanings that arise of this set of practices. Um, I think the, the fundamental premise, which is to study the register of code mixing in more public performances of speech um, than the way that linguists study it is incredibly uh, invaluable. And what it enables us is uh, to understand multilingual competence uh, at the linguistic level and to recognize both the limits of our theorizing, our theorizing as linguists about it but also the fact that our social theories are not capacious enough to take what are frequently, as Francesca just presented, um, contradictions and to be able to synthesize a whole out of them. Uh, quite embarrassingly for me, since I feature in several essays in the book as the linguist Aisha Kidwai, which is only a, a reference uh, to the fact 
that there was only one linguist interacting with the, in, in that workshop uh, and rather than to any uniqueness. So I think of myself just as the prime number and when you've only encountered a numeral one. Uh, I think that I'd like to just very briefly because uh, Francesca has ordered me not to speak for more than 10 minutes so that there's plenty of time for discussion. Um, I just want to restrict my comments to what, what these essays contribute to in a, as an understanding of linguistic uh, of English as a social, social linguistic, uh, sociological phenomenon. So, so now linguists are usually much more interested um, about the questions of what happens in our heads in terms of grammar when you um, do uh, code switching. So when you switch or you mix languages, that is if you just in, insert words or if you mix um, um, larger sections of theirs. We've been more, and so to try and figure out what we call constraints, that when can you insert that word or switch into another language, when is it prescribed? And uh, so we have, terms like uh, the free morpheme constraint, the equivalence constraints, etc. And because it is patently obvious, even to linguists, that the only thing that is happened, uh, that what is happening in your head is not the only thing. Social meanings of code mixing, code switching have been typically by linguists treated at the macro level. So what are the societal attitudes to so the two constituent languages? So if I switch into English, uh, am I demonstrating social class? Um, uh, and are we, am I adopting a communicative strategy of exclusion or inclusion? Uh, is, situ is the switching associated with situation type? That is, um, not all languages are uh, equal and that remains constant or is it more metaphorical? Etc. Now, what for me, what is absolutely fascinating about this book and incredibly insightful is all the essays um, is that what it does is it takes the issue of social meanings to far beyond the basic questions that linguists have asked and which are then patently doomed to fail because. Um, uh, they, they study one situation type or they uh, have very rough and ready um, uh, classification of social phenomena. I think it is at two levels that this is interesting for me and I'll come to the second, term, which I think is the question that is not really answered um, uh, in the, uh, by this particular study and therefore I'm looking forward to a English live too not written by linguists, um, is, um, is the question what, the, um, uh, what Asif Agra has called um, uh, enregisterment. That is, um, is the will to English and the existence of this um, um, variety or a process which is called English, is it, a, is it in undergoing a stage of enregisterment is it that is, is so what Aga means by this term is that what it does it indexes stereotypic characteristics of particular interactional roles and of relations among speakers. And so then it gets, becomes a register. Now it seems um, uh, that uh, what Francesca and Ravikant in the, in the introduction, even while acknowledging it as a process, what they do is they, they think that it is emerging as a stable social act, um, uh, which uh, perhaps the default language of metropolitan youth. Uh, that's the, so they essentially are going with a enregis, enregisterment uh, view of, uh, and that, that perhaps is the one truth of it. But as we've seen that, um, and that, that of course then can be deployed as it has been shown by um, all the essays in a, in, to encode a variety of uh, uh, social attitudes. But I think that uh, the essays, which are all beautifully written and extremely, and I think that's just a wonderful book, 
that uh, what we get is a more complex and uh, slightly more contingent view of uh, the social meanings that uh, emerge from English. Um, so they think, many of the essays think of English as a process, not as a unitary language. Uh, one striking feature of all, a large number of the essays is that when you think about, uh, when the writers think about uh, English and Hindi or English and Bhojpuri, they don't think only about those two languages. And of course, we had that um, instruction from uh, Rita Kotari's earlier volume, but it's it tells us something about what it means to speak multiple languages, something that linguistic theory and I think generally we struggle to capture in any theoretical paradigm that when you think about your linguistic practice about one language, it's like all the entire ecology of your languages comes into play. So it's a bit like what Bhartrihari said uh, about the word, he said that you know the word is like a lamp. When you light it, it not only reveals itself, but the world around it. And that's the feeling that I constantly got through the essays. Oh, what some of the essays uh, do is tell us that um, uh, this is, you know, one reason why they're calling it a process. So for example, the Ratnakar uh, Tripathi essay says, uh, says that, you know, um, uh, that this might in fact, this process might be not just a stage in the life of Hindi. So that in the, if a register is being formed, then the goal has not been achieved. And are the multiple meanings that we get, the social meanings arising just from that. So right now it extends to almost every aspect of interaction. So is one direction of change for stability to be um, restricted to a few um, uh, metaphoric or situation types. Uh, Santosh Desai essay says that English creates the space for new things to be said. So it makes language ownable because it doesn't carry the, you know, speaking in one language for a monolingual speaker, uh, for a multilingual speaker is to carry the entire weight of tradition. Uh, so perhaps by, by this act of fragmentation of languages, you make, you create a new idiom, which doesn't require perfect knowability in um, know, knowingness rather in each of the languages. And I think that that, so that's actually in a native speaker's assessment of their linguistic ability. So um, this reminds me of a question that, you know, I, I was part of many years ago, 25 years ago, or asking uh, of a project which asked who speaks Urdu? And the vast majority of people, uh, and this is, was done all over India, but it was done um, in UP and Delhi, and it was Muslim people were uh, a, a large number of respondents. And the answer that just kept on coming back was Mili Juli. No, no, I, you know, yeah, Urdu is my language, but what I speak is Mili Juli. So that there perhaps that rather than looking at it, it's newness as a new register, that one should conceive of this as that, you know, in a multilingual society, these languages are old, that the process is old, even if the form is new. Uh, another um, suggestion from Rabin Atlami is that the process of English, it creates a space for regional languages too, uh, to um, Hindi to find expression, which I think relates to the fact that you know, uh, what, you, what the process does is mix various languages, um, uh, fragments of languages, so related to the other part. Okay. It is also a new kind of Hindi. In fact, I think the article, um, Akriti's article um, uh, talks about, it's called the Naivali Hindi. Uh, and so on, I mean, I could go on. I think each essay here points to the fact that the enrich enregistrement process uh, 
it's certainly there is a process, there is a meaning, but this, this register has yet not formed. And uh, what is the strategy then? I mean, is it to stay back and say, let it happen? And that brings me to my final point, that a lot of these, um, uh, the very public forms of speech that we've looked at are actually performed speech. So the um, uh, speech or writing. So it is newspapers um, where we make an aesthetic value judgment about whether uh, it's too much, Nambara times Hindi is too much, right? Some signages might be too much. And, but um, uh, how much of this is manipulated speech? And I don't mean necessarily manipulated as a negative um, um, context, but it is true that these, I mean, what we see through the book in various essays, the historicity of this, that we can't say, say on Hindi cinema, I say, well, you know, this was always there. There was always some code switching. So in by naming the beast, are we, and by the active intervention of um, the internet uh, and uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the publishing houses, by advertising, is are we naming, are we creating something which is a register, which in itself, uh, which wants to become a register? And certainly right now, contemporarily, some people are hanging on to it, but there is also aesthetic attachment. And the absolute final point, in some essays do make a distinction between matrix language, um, uh, Hindi, English, and matrix language, uh, Hindi uh, code switching. But I think that that's one direction that one should look at um, in, in the future. So is it matrix, language English. Years ago, a student of mine, um, when looking at the early, you know, in the 2000s, when looking at FM um, uh, from two, the 2000s, and what she found was that there was a very interesting um, a phenomenon that everything that was said into English was immediately, next utterance, translated into Hindi. So then you know, there was a particular um, creation of that, um, of that variety, the English variety, which was um, not going to be uh, completely um, intelligible and therefore the translation. So that the historicity of the phenomenon needs to be investigated to see how much of manipulation and that in you know, all public form of speech, speaking and writing is a manipulation. But that whether this, through the advertising um, and other, in, and the journalism industry, how much for, and in the cinema, where um, accent doesn't seem to be playing an important role, it's dialectal varieties in terms of speech. So thank you very much for, and I hope I haven't taken more time than Francesca ordered me to. And I'm sure there'll be a really, wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, uh, for those comments and, and praise. As you know, we were very relieved that you, uh, that you liked the book <laughs> and that we had not uh, made some uh, egregious mistake. So, um, is it Krishna next? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, that's a hard act to follow, Aisha. Uh, and I'm sorry that she's not here in the room because I have been hoping that I that um, she would be um, just to say hello. I haven't seen her in a long time. And saying hello, I, I can't see her at the back, so now I'm feeling a bit out of body. Okay, uh, just to say uh, thank you for having me. It's very nice to be on um, this side of this desk. Uh, I've been on that side a lot. Uh, I think I was on that side of it uh, during the English conference as well uh, for the three or whatever days of, of it in 2014, is it? Um, and it was great fun. 
Uh, I want to say, um, oh, an, a corrective before I start, which is that I am indeed uh, these days a professor of practice at the Jindal School of Journalism and Communication, but I'm not really sure I'm a professor. This is, please do not address me as professor. Uh, it's very worrying. I am a journalist and I was trained in history and anthropology, but I did not become a historian or an anthropologist. I am that something somewhere at the back, but yeah, okay. All of those disclaimers apart. Okay, um, I want to say that the book is uh, indeed, as Aisha says, and as everyone who will read it will know, uh, or even if you have been part of the conversations around it, uh, is a scintillating set of essays. It's actually really various and um, comes at the subject from a multiple multiplicity of viewpoints and a multiplicity of um, I don't know, um, uh, locations as well, I think linguistic locations and cultural locations and so on. Uh, and yet I think that, uh, as Aisha just said, uh, something that I was thinking a little bit, and I think she of course has put it more articulately than my inchoate sort of thought about this, which is that a lot of the language that is being analyzed in these essays across the board is perhaps performed. Uh, and uh, that might be something to think about. Um, I haven't yet, but I'm, I'm responding to Aisha, the, the fact that we we are talking about language on TV, language in cinema, language in advertising, uh, language in the media is probably something to factor into how we, what conclusions we may draw uh, about the language in general, because perhaps people speaking in ordinary life uh, is a little different from how that speaking in ordinary life is represented even in popular culture. And I say this as someone that has spent most of my life uh, working not as an anthropologist of, uh, I mean, whatever, whatever, for lack of a better word, the real world, but of looking anthropologically as a critic of popular culture, writing about cinema, writing about books, and writing about language as it is then encapsulated. So. I'm, that I don't, I'm putting that there, uh, and then I'm going to go to what notes I did actually make. Um, uh, forgive me for this, this is going to be a little schematic and it's going to sort of goes around uh, uh, my own trains of thought as I was reading the book. It does not uh, cover all the essays, um, and I'm sorry to, to do this, but I, I enjoyed all of them actually very much, but this is what is my train of thought. So now, um, so I want to start by maybe um, drawing attention to something in Santosh Desai's very enjoyable account of advertising of the transformation of uh, language, which I think all of us that have grown up um, uh, in India or uh, were in India or have been in India through the time of sort of pre-liberalization and post-liberalization, we know this, uh, but he talks about in his essay, he sort of provides a, an, an account of how the 1980s when he enters, 1985, I think he says, he enters the world of advertising uh, in India. And he says that it was a totally English speaking uh, milieu. And he talks about that, um, how that has shifted and how, um, you know, so he's, 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 he, he has some funny stories about the advertising milieu as it was then. He says, for instance, that um, uh, th there were uh, uh, many conversations because, of course, the people that were running advertising firms and making advertisements in the English language advertising world, obviously, he is talking about at this point, there um, people assumed that, we, quote unquote, Gita from Gorakhpur will not understand uh, this was a kind of a, a, a figure of speech, but also an imaginary character that advertising creatives apparently used. And uh, then they went on, however, even if Gita from Gorakhpur doesn't understand, apparently, uh, very often, and you might remember this, uh, advertisements went ahead with what he says is the idea of sort of selling a premium product or being associated as uh, with something upmarket. So set a sort of class at the expense of comprehension. Uh, he gives an example of of, uh, the biscuit uh, Marie, which was marketed in the 80s as English Marie. And, uh, you know, with a reference to, in the ad, for instance, reference to my fair lady, um, which then, you know, so a conversation around how this may not be understandable to most people. And then uh, it doesn't matter. This, this is because within the advertising creative room, uh, there weren't any, quote unquote, Geetas from Gorakhpur, and they would just I don't know, they, they would, it was able, it was, and he talks about how this changes. Of course, um, he says, 
one second, I'm going to find you uh, a quote, which one second. Um, Okay. Anyway, uh, and of course, all of us know other ads like this. The one that came into my head when I was listening to this was uh, uh, the ultimate sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 embodiment of posh English with a Simi Garewal selling uh, society tea with a line which I used to, I don't know, I for some reason love repeating, which was, uh, afternoon tea parties are delightful. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but you know. Uh, it, so it's somehow English Marie brought me back to this. And I thought, well, yeah, there were a lot of such advertisements, you know, completely disconnected from pretty much most people that are that are going to um, want even to to drink society tea uh, they're not going to be pouring uh, you know their tea in in the way that Simi Garewal is sort of pouring it in this in this in this very beautiful um, full-on porcelain English uh, looking service um, tea service but anyway but what they say then maps for advertising the opening up of the consumer universe and therefore the creative or production part of that universe because a market opens up to people who belong in that purely English speaking elite that until then had controlled advertising. And this is, of course, true. Uh, and it's true beyond advertising in that it is, it is true in the sphere of media and popular culture more generally. But I want to contrast this somehow, this, what came into my head when I was, uh, this, it's something that I was reading recently, which is the, um, it's a film, actually. I was reading the screenplay. Uh, the film was made in the 1980s as well. And in that film, uh, the film is actually Pradeep Krishan's film in which Annie gives it those ones, um, which is was written, it so happened by Arundhati Roy. Uh, in, um, she wrote it in 1988 and it was screened on Doordarshan. And this is not a popular film. And I'm sure that many of you may or may not have seen it I don't know uh, I am going to just 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 say that it's a it, it's a I think it's a little polarizing the film even now uh, a lot of people that have um, grown up in Delhi University certain kinds of colleges may uh, have a great and deep nostalgia for it uh, for good reason in that in and Roy's script because Roy's script was based on her own experience of studying at what was then the premier institute of architecture in the city SPA and uh, she in fact wrote an introduction to this screenplay, uh, which was published by Penguin in 2003, uh, the edition that I was reading at least. And she says that her primary concern when writing that screenplay was to capture the English that they spoke in college. And uh, getting the language, she says, getting, uh, getting the language just right. English as she is spoken by students in Delhi University was to be one of the main characters in the film. English as an alloy, melted down and then refashioned, soldered together with Hindi, occasionally even a little Punjabi, to suit our specific communication requirements, by which he means as college students in SPA. Um, but the, the other thing that she says in this is that, uh, I'm just to give you a flavor of the of the script and the film. Um, it's full of such lines as you know. Uh, I'm giving you random examples from students so in the in the in this in the films. Uh, so sale submission nahi karna hai, and then yes, I'll just topo some purana thesis. You know, so this kind of language had not appeared on the Hindi film screen certainly, and there was no Indian. English language cinema in the moment that this was created. So it was radically new. And the reason I bring up Annie actually after Desai is to say that here, it is somehow the mixing, this mixing that she produces, she recognizes it in her 2003 introduction to it, that as being an elite clubby endeavor, she says, I quote, even as I was writing the script, I knew that it would be perceived as a clubby, spoilt thing to do. It was an enterprise that deliberately and almost by definition excluded most people and most of, quote, the market, never mind the masses. Nevertheless, I found myself completely absorbed and fascinated by the idea of accurately reproducing the idiom and rhythm of the language that I had spent so many years of my life speaking. This is a quote from the introduction. So I wondered what is going on? You know, if we look at the world of advertising, it seems that bringing the mixing in makes it less clubby. Um, or if we look at the world of Indian English fiction, 
um, for instance, uh, later, where uh, uh, Francesca's wonderful essay on the Anuja Chauhan book, much, much later, 20 years later, perhaps, uh, Zoya Factor, um, shows with so much uh, flair that, you know, th there is a sense that you're, you're, you're legitimizing, um, you know, this thing that, um, this thing that Desai says, that it's legitimized, that it's the making the English speaking and English thinking elite, which would have otherwise felt a little alienated, feel part of the mainstream. But why then does Roy see what she's doing as clubby? She doesn't see it as being entering the mainstream. Is it just that she's doing this so early? There is no mainstream. She is doing this all on her own. Or is it, I mean, and these are questions I had about maybe perhaps any other people would, would like to answer. Maybe for me, the answer lies as always anything to do with Hindi and English in the details. Because it seems that uh, bilinguality of the sort that is in th that is shown or depicted in the world of in which Annie gives it those ones is uh, filled with people speaking yes mixtures of Hindi and English but there are different uh, locations within that universe and some of them are English matrix uh, speakers of Hindi and some of them are Hindi matrix speakers of some English. Uh, there, and, and that itself is enough apparently to signal to us who is cool and who is not cool. I mean, very much like Zoya factor later, but this is really early and it is. Um, so for instance, you know, um, the, 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 it, and the screenplay makes it very clear. So Anuthiti Roy, I think is co cognizant uh, of the fact that she's making it very clear who's cool and who's not. So a character called Lekha, who everybody wants to refer to, I mean, the cool people want to call her Lakes, which they tell us she doesn't like. Uh, she, so Lekha, who is Lakes, says, for instance, hi, sir, I'm so confused. Pata nahi kuch samaj mein nahi aara. And Samaj is written in the script as S-U-M-M-U-D-G-E. So to pronounce it, you know, like, so Roy is really like pedantic about the pronunciation of the accent of the English of the Hindi speaker now. So all of this is going on. And there is, however, there are other people and Arjun and Radha. Radha is played in the film by Arundhati Roy herself. And she is, of course, the heroine. And this Arjun is her boyfriend. Uh, and they can compare sort of in contrast to lakes uh, or lekha, they can compose bilingual sentences that contain linguistic jokes and they contain accents, they contain um, mockery of, uh, you know, certain kinds of pronunciations. And they also contain mockery of high registers of not just Hindi, but of English. So for instance, uh, you know, there's a whole section where there's some, there, there's somebody who is being mocked here, uh, who says, so there, Arjun says, but my dear girl, this is Grotsk. And this is supposed to be how that person says grotesque, right? Uh, and it's funny, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a bit much, yeah. And then it goes on and, or, or for instance, Radha says at some point, no, but you see this, the representation of, this is the representation of Jisnu Kendene Dvandatmak Bhotikvad in the subconscious psyche of the petty, petty bourgeois. Correct, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct, like that, yeah. Okay, this passage strikes me almost like the obverse of something which maybe all of us are more familiar with, which is, I don't know, Amitabh Bachchan in the Anthony Gonzalez song. It's at that level of ununderstandable set of words put together. But of course, we have been, even if we are Hindi film watchers, uh, if you have some, con you're conversant also with English, you've been brought up to think of that song as nonsense verse, fun but gibberish, right? Oh, wait, here, of course, it is that set of words is being used to illustrate, uh, I don't know, authority over both languages, many registers, etc. So I feel like there is no way that we can escape, uh, much as I, I would like to, uh, I feel like we cannot escape hierarchy between Hindi and English, even in its, um, okay, um, I'm going to try and come back from this quickly. So it seems to me that not very much has changed even since this Arundhati Roy uh, script moment or, or since Santosh Desai's claim that everything has changed in advertising. Yes, it has perhaps, but in the hierarchy of languages, English still rules, I feel like. And you cannot be cool if you only have a command over Hindi. I mean, you should assume as the book says, uh, quotes around everything I'm saying, I do not mean you cannot be cool. I mean, it is perceived in most parts of 
in the, the Indian uh, universe that you cannot. Um, I want to, I, I find very useful here, Ratnaka Tripathi's essay, for instance, where he has this schema where he lists a whole uh, set of social, different social, social situations where in which English either begins at the Hindi end and is then used uh, from if you are a Hindi matrix speaker and the reasons why you might add English and the other way, which is if you are an English matrix speaker and the reasons you might add Hindi. And I think all of these uh, exist, but again, I feel like there is very much a hierarchy in the way that we judge them depending again on our place in that hierarchy. The whole, I mean, sorry, this is a bit confusing, but it is how it is. Uh, it seems to me though that the, even as the mixing of Hindi and English has come to be since the 1990s, a much more frequent occurrence um, to the extent that pure Hindi and pure English may now sound, as Tripathi says, uh, like an artifice quote used by the pedant and the language expert, there is still no neutral ground even within English. Uh, in fact, perhaps there is none outside English either. Um, pure Hindi, um, as for instance, Mohini Gupta's essay, which is a lovely essay, uh, a revealing and quite scary essay on reality television, um, that shows uh, that even in that, the, the pure language, whether, you know, if, if you speak correct Hindi, is fine, but if you speak actually uh, Hindi with uh, with no English words and with words that the hosts decide is are old fashioned, then that too is a problem. That too is uncool. Um, I want to, uh, as given I've spent too many years watching too many films, I want to add another film, which is a 2022 film made by a 23 year old filmmaker. This is his first film. I don't know if this film is yet around. It's it's been uh, it's it's going to come to film festivals. It's called Ko Aham, and it's based on a novel, which is apparently a celebrated Hindi novel, which I haven't read. Uh, by Ashok Jamnani. The, the novel is 2007. The, the film is just, just made and is traveling to uh, film festivals and so on as we speak. In that, there is a Hindi-speaking protagonist, the different kind of college atmosphere. The student is in a, uh, comes from a village to a town on the banks of the Narmada to study philosophy. Uh, we don't know the name of the town. It seems like it's a very small place. And um, uh, it isn't Maheshwar, this I can say, because that's the only town on the Narmada I have been to. But Baki But us college he sits in he's he goes to live in a landlady's house. That landlady's daughter is also in his college. Two conversations take place on the first day of college. The first is that the landlady's daughter, who is kind of, I guess she's a senior or something, she says to him. Uh, something and he says in answer, G. Hindi mein film hai, sab Hindi mein bol rahe. And so she laughs a lot and she says, G to mat bolo, at least you can say okay. You know, uh, so this this is the first thing. And then the next morning on the way to class, they meet this kind of the, the, the cool friend of this, um, of the landlady's daughter, who is a man. And he says, uh, he asks him, he asks our protagonist something. Our protagonist, by the way, is called Bhavitavya, which should tell you something. And he, uh, he, he's introduced and he says uh, something he answers about, uh, I forget, I haven't taken notes on when I was watching the film, which is a month ago. He says, he says some things which involve the words chintan, vichilit, and immediately the boy that he has been introduced to, the college student, says to Bhavitavya, Aap kya hamesha hi is tarah se Sanskrit mein baat karte? So it's not quite ragging, but it could have been. And because it is prevented, because Bhavitavya, our hero, uh, uh, responds in English. He says, I can handle English as well. And this is literally the only sentence he speaks in English in the entire film. But this is what he says. I can handle English as well, lekin mein apni bhasha bolna pasand karta uh, I, this may be slight paraphrase, but this is more or less what he says. So mocking male college mate at this point shakes his hand and says, Aap to bhot padmi lagte hain, bagera, and from now those pakki, whatever, and that goes on. So I just wanted to say that the need to know English has now reached an unnamed small town college campus in what is perhaps somewhere in Madhya Pradesh. And you can choose not to pepper your Hindi with English words in this Hindi Pradhan universe, which is a very upper caste one. I just want to say that this philosophy professor and the student and everybody Brahman um, in the film. Uh, they are all happy to teach. Uh, the professor, for instance, is very happy to teach this very serious student in Hindi. He's teaching complicated philosophical debates in Hindi. Uh, but 
the student needs to to establish coolness on that campus by saying that he can handle english saying that in english and also the professor his coolness is established for us in the sphere of that universe of that films universe uh, by the fact that he has international philosophy, philosophy conference to send papers to um no no other professors seem to have that so i feel like okay this is i will i really will end um okay so there i think there is a hierarchy in the world that we cannot get away from perhaps um the second thing i wanted to bring in was just very very quickly i will do this is to ravi kant is not is he are you here oh you're here oh yeah super okay i'm going to disagree very slightly with one one of the things that you say at the end of your very fun uh, account of uh, english sani cinema uh, which all of you should read it's it's great fun um uh, as always ravi kant has the best examples of various things and including i don't know many references to dictionaries which are just just astonishing uh, but yeah having given, given us many examples of song lyrics and female film titles and actual dialogues from what is accurately now i think called bollywood and no longer called hindi cinema um he says radhikant that the patriotic consensus against english has withered away and i just wanted to ask uh, i don't know whether this is true i feel as if we are in a world in which um there the, we do have uh, a very strong political impetus that seems to be uh, pushing for hindi uh, at least uh, every hindi divas if not uh, at other you know opportune and opportune moments and um, i'm i'm not sure about this uh, the other thing perhaps maybe the old major patriotic reaction to the use of english has changed in form um and um but i want to draw attention here to say for instance i want to pit maybe akriti's akriti madhwani's wonderful article on um hindi publishing and hindi yug mud the publisher and divya prakash dubey's books and ted talks against this conclusion that ravikant seems to be suggesting please forgive me if this is on not true but yeah dubey's novels um i uh, uh okay i'll i'll leave the side thing out but basically i feel like there is a point about patriotism that seems to emerge from mandwani's essay um where his calls for hindi to be seen as cool or for people to put their money where their mouth is and buy uh, books in hindi as matrabhasha uh, i think those are those are very much about claiming uh, a this nayi wali hindi which contains a much 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 larger proportion of english words than would be allowed 20 years ago but it's still claimed as hindi it is performed as hindi it is uh, published as hindi and i feel like the, in that the non pure um has been allowed in and so perhaps the change that has happened is that the non pure language is allowed and can be claimed to be patriotic uh, i don't think the patriotic consensus uh against english is gone but it's it's as if english is invisible inside hindi okay i'll leave it here thank you very much uh, tisha and uh, over to avinash and then maybe we can open it to uh, two question thank you yeah thank you francesca thank you ravika and avdendra uh yeah just uh, uh, taking a cue off from prisha uh it's almost like coming back to csd as an alumni after 15 years <laughs> so thank you for inviting me <laughs> to this place uh, uh, having said that uh, i'll start with two or three caveats again <laughs> the vitrisha started one of course this is uh, coming uh, part of an academic reader of because i have not been into academics for many many years now but as someone who is in who's had a lot of interest in variations of hindis and uh, many of the hindis which uh, i was not aware at that time that they were actually variations of english uh, and which uh, while actually coming across uh, i reading uh, through the essays of this book which again incidentally again i have not read in complete so apologies for that also i've read about eight ten essays and i'm using that and probably while i go and speak about what i carried from this um, they may not be direct references to many of uh, uh, the essays which i have read but they'll be direct or i'm sure uh, those who 
authors would probably uh, get their resonance from what I'm trying to say. Now, I want to start with this brief, uh, small, very well-read, uh, recited poem by Raghavir Sahai. Dekho sham ghar jate baap ke kandhe par, bache ki oop dekho. Usko tumhari angrezi nahi keh sakti. Aur meri hindi bhi keh nahi paayegi agle saal. I think that anxiety of where the language is taking us, and I think English has to be rooted in that context, the entire de debate and discussion. I think this book marvelously illustrates that, and I think that was one of my key takeaways. The how is that anxiety of inadequacy of Hindi and not being able to speak to a whole range of concerns, including about that boredom of a child, Hindi I think somebody has mentioned that in the Buryat, Indian eyes, Hindi eyes word. I think that is the departure, point of departure for us uh, and for me at least in, in this language, uh, in this book. I think that is very important. Now, the question, however, is, is English or its many variants are able to address that? And I think that will be another point of departure for us. And I think this book tries to address uh, some of those questions. However, I'll just begin with some uh, broad understanding of what I could uh, get from uh, the book so far. That one, while there have been multiple uh, experiments with English uh, pre-90s, but English predominantly is a phenomenon, a phenomenon from 90s onwards with the globalization and market. Uh, it has, of course, it's right from the back of the market. It writes in the back of uh, certain kinds of consumer class emerging, it writes in the back of multiple uh, fluidities around identities and locations and so on. Uh, of course, technology. It also, one of the things which I struck me about the book was, and I want to actually talk about that, is the fun element, which is constantly, uh, uh, you know, uh, referred to, or uh, in some ways it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, so just let me, uh, you know, the very first line of acknowledgement from the editors is, as can be expected, expected, a project on English was a lot of fun. And we all, I mean, it starts on that, uh, which is important and which I found very significant. If you look at the titles of uh, many of the essays, it gives you that flavor. One whiskey and one masala dosa, the many meanings of English and advertising. English is cool, yaar. Not too nanga panga, variety mixing and certification and English chiclet. Hindi I am publishing, of course, uh, takes off from a slogan, but uh, in a song. English Tani cinema. I do fatafat constipation with Goras and tip top Gora English, which, uh, of course, uh, they say by uh, Helen Ashton and Rachel Goy and so on. English signage and small, uh, no, of course, this is uh, Ravi Khan's essay. And then uh, English FM Kush Political Ho Jai by Vinay Dhanav. I, I was very actually intrigued by this, but I found it very significant also that there's a lot of celebration of what is uh, actually happening around with the coming of English and its midi variants. And I think this book tries to speak to this uh, phenomenon of English in that language and address that. Now the question is, what is this celebration for? And that's my second question. Is this a celebration for uh, actually an attempt to address all those anxieties which Raghavir Sahai was talking about in his poem. Is this a celebration for English, for a range of subversions which English is trying to actually address through its language? Or is this also a celebration of for, uh, and therefore actually talking, uh, but is this also a celebration for uh, a kind of, and that is a, a uh, very, very interesting question where I find the book is trying to struggle with its two dominant strands is the, when it speaks of that we are still taking the line that it largely is a site of social hierarchical reproduction. Now there are these two tensions within the book, which I find very interesting also. And I think the, this book is trying to struggle with that. How much do we celebrate? How much do we actually keep a sharp eye on what is happening through this English? I think that is a tension which we need to look at. Uh, one of the other things which it does, and through series of essays that Nagar Tripathi talks about, it, Ravi Kant, many others, that I recognize in the editorial says, uh, piece says that they also recognize English as a process. 
and this is crossing the making i'll come back to that point uh, later in my uh, point but and very much they allude to therefore it's almost like hindustan uh, uh, what hindustani was at, at a certain historical phase of course ravi khan talks about that in the sense that you know it had a different legacy of trying to build on urdu and uh, hindi syntax together today it's english and so on it reminded me immediately of my own uh, uh, some of my own when i was a researcher of hindi 20 years ago the mahavi prasad duvedi is one quote which is very interesting uh, which he had written in one of his editorials that about this whole hindu hindustani debate that hindustani wo bhasha hai jisme a hindi bhashi pradesh ke log ek dusre se baat karte hain ya sahab log apne naukron se baat chit karte hain hindustani hindi ki jagah nahi le sakte हिंदी की हिंदी उस जगह को लेगी जो कि राष्ट्रभाषा का दर्जा प्राप्त करे और राष्ट्रभाषा का दर्जा आई एम पैराफ्रेजिंग हिम उसी को दिया जा सकता है जो कल्चर संस्कृति की भाषा है हमारी विराट ऐतिहासिक सांस्कृतिक संपदा की भाषा है नॉट इज अ क्लियर डिमार्केशन इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ द वे Mahavi Prasad Duvedi very clearly recognizes that you may be speaking what later on gets spoken as chutneyfied language or uh, English and so on and so forth, but that is not the language of power or even prestige and so on. So therefore, you have to build, and there is that tension which I guess is something which we need to recognize even today. And this is what uh, one of the interesting uh, continuing discussion between so-called Hindi. and uh, what we know as hindi and the variations of english re is representing before us and i think this is important uh, uh, point to recognize uh, and which is obviously based on certain notion of power actually then where is the power and i think therefore one of the key questions for me through rail reading this book was also that how the power is the question of power is being constantly negotiated or questioned and so on uh, having said that there are two questions on which i would two elements on which i would like and i would like to take my own uh, uh, and many of the scholars have uh, talked about it but it's basically you can say that it's nostalgia as i mentioned the beginning of my own journey is around various forms of hindi is that to understand and recognize the pre histories of english and i think very important so what are those and they are not uh, and while some of the authors have talked about pre history of english are in the space of college Latin law, judiciary, professional spaces, etc., etc. I think we need to go deeper than that, and that's one of my uh, understanding of this, uh, which is local. What are the local prehistories of English? What are the literary prehistories? I think that we can't, since you are here, and many other people have talked about that in their essays also. But I would still want us to dig deeper on that. What is the state, and not colonial, pre, post-colonial, pre-90s pre state? contribution and this is an interesting point for me which while talking to some of the friends it's i was reflecting i think i will just try and talk about and what are the different multi regional contributions to english which of course uh, forms the basis of uh, santosh desai and so on and so forth many of but those are very important now let's take local antecedents of um, english you know 1990 is seen as a for this book also for many of our sociological analysis of what happened to india is seen as the key break point so to speak of what happens to india afterwards march 1990 i was just google and i i was surprised to find because i remember the essay i didn't know when it was published and while reading this is i was doing some my navar times produced this very famous short column uh, piece by nasharat joshi mai bihar ja ke nervous a gaya <laughs> it's a very celebrated it's a short column and this was just before the globalization was beginning now just a paragraph from there and i googled it i found it out also on uh, so just about tab itminan dilate us kuli ne mujhse kaha aap itna nervous kyon ho rahe nervous shabd nervous ho wahan ki boli mein samajh aayega maine socha na tha jab maine kisa patna mein ek sajjan ko sunaya to unhe aashcharya nahi hua to bole aap nervous aaye rahe honge tabhi ne kuli ne kal kuli ne dekh kar kaha hoga यह सुन अंग्रेजी के सुरक्षित भविष्य को लेकर मेरे मन में कोई संदेह नहीं रह गया आई मीन आई एम जस्ट टॉकिंग अबाउट वन एंड दिस इज नॉट जस्ट टू साइट वन ऑड इंस्टेंस मेनी ऑफ आर बिहारी नॉन बट नॉट जस्ट क्वेश्चन ऑफ बिहारी नो हाउ द इंग्लिश इज हिंदी आइज सो टू स्पीक 
pre 90s very as part of your local lexicon and that is some of the essays ratnakar and tripathi and all also have referred to. so it's it's not just incidental uses of one one or two words here completely actually indigenized so to speak you know much later i went to gujarat and uh, one of my first meeting when i was traveling as part of my professional work i went to i was traveling to gujarat and i was working there and in one of the conversations one person introducing himself is and my papa ho gaye the uske baad main aaya and it struck me i mean it took me 2 minutes to realize what did he mean and then i realized papa off ho gaye the is not just actually used in a certain professional uh, or he was trying to explain it to me it was used as a widely prevalent phrase across gujarat and rural rural urban all across so it was part of the gujarati language so papa off ho gaye the husband shant ho gaye the this i heard in maharashtra mere husband shant ho gaye husband of course now shant, shant is not off the point is these interplay of localization of are happening in many many levels and we need to kind of recognize and probably there's a need to dig deeper also into it that where is that coming from now one can speculate and i will come to that in a moment but i think one can speculate one is of course as many of you in your essays have mentioned that they are state intrusion directly state as an educator state as a lawyer judiciary state as revenue collector state as modernizer and so on and so forth so state is and therefore uh, it's important that uh, it's coming uh, from many of those uh, but what is it that therefore an illiterate or those people who are not don't have even direct exposure to those kind of institutional spaces uh, for english get out of that and they uh, they actually make it part of their vocabulary now coming to literary antecedents again arvikant you have talked about uh, uh, manusham joshi and tata professor festival i want to make a, again a larger point here it's not one odd novel if you look at and it's not just one author if you, but there are certain authors if you look at the entire over of manusham joshi and tata professor sachi all come and comes much later his more celebrated novels kuru kuru swaha uh, kasab it's like it's amazing riot of playing with english with multiple languages and not just hindi there is mr tirkha mr talati and they both speak two different kinds of english in the same space which you refer to in uh, zoya factor uh, uh, <laughs> this happens in 80s 88 87 80 when uh, kuru kuru saha is being written and kasab full of these interplays and no meaning so and uh, mr talati and then this becomes a big, uh, language line significant line from uh, you know it's but let me go back further renu renu is a master player of this bimmal mama many of us would probably remember him not just as a character sketch of from uh, uh, man tulsi ki gand that was the book he but because a real character but he appears as a very interesting character in parti parikatha where there is a character who is seen as half mad who loves experimenting just like you know tata professor and characters with mixing hindi and english words together dimakrishi and people say what is dimakrishi similarly uh, um, in malanchal you will find many of these experiments happening so there's a so what is interesting for me is that how some of these writers are actually building that localization which i referred to earlier into their literary register and by bringing these different elements i think it's very important to actually uh, there are standard uh, experimentations in hindi and english also nagarjun chandu maine sapna dekha um, you know chandu maine sapna dekha tum to bahut bade doctor ho chandu maine sapna dekha tum duty mein tatpar ho and it's a standard you know uh, way of using english in, in but many of these people i'm talking about are coming from certain roots local roots of english so to speak and then they are experimenting with that in their uh literary uh, writings and so on i think that needs to be uh by the way not only in this and this is one of my favorite areas where, where i have always been a uh, i grew up as a uh, as i said a reader of multiple uh, versions of english and one of the most popular exposure to english for me in 70s and 80s was uh, pulp fiction it's not a one or two uh, instances here and there if you read of perfect colonel ranjit ranu gulshan nanda suran mohan pathak who is still alive and very much writing 
and not only once again writing with uh, their own uh, certain experimental english but look at pansat lakhi the dagati is one of his most celebrated novel punjabi and english come together so beautifully in that and in a hindi so called uh, novel so these and these are uh, I, i still remember i'm some random novels i i, I recall uh, and there's a character who says there's a uh, yani ki great garbadation now there these exp- and it's not just happening once or twice and in one or two language uh, odd novels it's the major and that is another exposure to english in a very popularized way whoever was reading popular literature uh, pulp fiction of from at least from 70s 80s onwards i can tell i don't know about before, before that and so on so i think we my point is that we need to dig more deeper into these prehistories and i think i would really urge just because there is very interesting a uh, lot of material there how that because the journey doesn't stop there sorry i'm uh, what happens is and incidentally one more i i, I have not read to personal's book though i have read about it i'm sure he must have because he uses chatty english sundar popo and others i don't know whether he has talked about that or not the chat the there is a international dimension to localization of hindi and english pulori bina chatni kaise bani was not written and sung by an hindi wala in india it was written by a trinidadian and sung and made popular uh, uh sundar popo and which became the famous genre of uh, you know chatni music actually and that's with yeah sorry yeah exactly so i mean I, there are many of many of these very i'm sorry i have my notes like a typical digital age wala here so <laughs> not in so i think what we need to sort of recognize is that localization has these prehistories of english has these prehistories what is now happening and coming back to present is that way is that localization having arrived to this entire very interesting documentation of in today's uh, uh, whole re- range of registers uh, uh, in today's post 90s uh, way is it headed and once again i would just reflect and i think it's interesting that uh, where it is headed is a question which uh, aisha kidwai was also talking about uh, in some senses and i think one of the things which i would really uh, uh, be interested in uh, to look at this phenomenon of suddenly this is thanks to ott platforms etc massive plethora of uh, series like many of you would have seen and popular is small town stories now return to the local so to speak panchayat or villages gullak ghar wapsi ghar wapsi is almost apocryphal that you have done your bit you have made your million now come back let's go back is it's also actually it will be worth exploring is a market also returning back in its uh, it is now that uh, metropolitan cities are getting saturated and now that you're going back to smaller medium town towns and so on what is happening and in these spaces also there's a lot of language experiment which is happening and uh, so how do we document and see that process uh, one last point i want to make before some three four questions and i'll shut up <laughs> uh, is this uh, once again another very interesting area of uh, cinema uh, i know that people have talked about uh, cinema many of the authors and all have talked about cinema and multiple variations uh, i think what is what will be uh, what is very interesting is once again to look at this whole localization in cinema uh, i mean it's not just gang- gangs of wasapur doing some experiment with songs but an entire diction the, the way with which it experiments with english in its everyday conversation so on so you have that on one hand set in the uh, epo- uh, well, the small town dhanbad on the other hand you have fukre uh, which is set in delhi but is can't be you know fitted into a standardized hindi or even english it has a very regional flavor of what we know as english and so on how do, how do we understand these two phenomena once again where are the class locations i think it's important to actually un- uh, in- dig deeper there and then contrast it with a movie like delhi belly now delhi belly has a very interesting uh, delhi belly again set in delhi and you know i have my own personal very interesting when i saw it uh, like many of us uh, we love the movie it was funny the way it plays with language etc etc it i mean delhi belly is actually indianized phrase and and so on and builds on that uh, 
and then later on i was at a friend's place and i said have you seen jelly belly he said no i said you must see it and switch it on and i i was stuck i i was shocked because the language very different i said what happened i mean this is not that language i had seen when i had gone to cinema hall so i then i looked at it and i said let's just then it was uh, shown that this is the hindi version of delhi belly so when i had seen delhi belly in the cinema hall i had not even realized that it was actually so called english version of delhi belly i think we need to recognize this that where is it that that fluidity is coming from is that and i think that is important from certain class location which you are talking about in zoya uh, factor but i think it's not just about class location but uh, i think what uh, trisha was trying to talk about reproduction of those hierarchies very clearly through the, uh, those class values where while you have a whole palette of different variations of english you are privileging the entire world around you through a certain kind of class language and class driven uh, uh, lens that brings me to this point that and i want to then therefore touch upon this point made by akriti in her paper and i think it's important to recognize that just to minute yeah and i'll just find up here so sorry to recognize is the fact that uh there are certain versions of english we are while we can be celebrating whole range of diversity subversions attempted subversions and all but there are also certain attempts at homogenization of language at a time when there's a larger flux of politics is happening which is talking for larger cultural homogenization larger nationalization of cultural traditions and so on in that context what is this what are these different visions of english taking we are uh, talking about are they addressing those i think that will be i think akriti's uh, uh, paper talks about and hints about that that even english of certain variants of english in their attempt to actually take over the larger space of india and new language are talking about certain not just certain market driven aspirations but they are talking about certain idea of nation certain idea of nation culture and homogeneity and i think that is very crit critical point for me finally the last point uh, uh and uh, and i think that's where i want so one of the last thing i said multi regional uh, variations again way back in 90s when i used to be student in jnu so one of the uh, i remember i just suddenly reminded me uh, two actually one uh, post colonial state very briefly cricket and i think somebody has referred to it but the cricket why because it was not for hindi walas that they learned english because of that but because non english uh, non hindi walas who learned hindi because of that and then many of the anecdotes will see बॉल टप्पा खाकर ऑफ स्टम्प से बाहर गई एक सिंगल लेने की कोई गुंजाइश नहीं नो सुशील दोषी इन इज प्राइम स्पीकिंग दैट लैंग्वेज एंड सो ऑन एंड यू आर एब्जॉर्बिंग अ सर्टन काइंड ऑफ लैंग्वेज व्हिच इज एक्सेसिबल टू यू बाय यूजिंग हिंदी सिंटैक्स बट लॉट ऑफ एंड दिस इज अ स्टेट व्हिच इज थ्रू इट्स ऑल इंडिया रेडियो व्हिच इज एक्चुअली टेलिंग यू दिस इज द वर्जन ऑफ हिंदी व्हिच यू कैन आल्सो एक्सेप्ट and finally and just i'm so sorry to hear this uh, uh is the fact that therefore is this are we reaching a stage where and i think with the coming of ott greater exposure etc it's not just and if you look at all the social media platform it's not just hindi i, I think a lot of people have talked about it the tamil is has its own interaction with english telugu is uh, doing all languages are uh, in, interacting english and creating uh, mixed languages my sense is that is this going to stop there is this going to be evolution of a last level of uh, not last but another level of language where multiple of these multilingualities multiple languages or not just hindi and english exposure but many of these regional languages are going to create the next level of interface for it i'll stop here thank you i'm so sorry about taking six. thank you very much um I think we want to open to questions, no, rather than trying to answer. You've been uh, listening very patiently, so. Um, you don't believe in the Trump response. Right. <laughs> I mean, I can do it now, but I think probably. Do you, do you want me to do it now, or do you, should I should I wait and see if uh, there are questions? No? Questions huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or comments. Huh. Huh. Hello. Okay, 
Um, look, I, I'm sorry, I came in late, so I, I might have missed very much. But, I, but in what I have heard, I find two notions which are both at play, and there seems to me that they both, as they were both embody complexities and are in contradiction with each other, or at least in tension with each other. One is the notion of hierarchy, and the other is the notion of subversion. Now, uh, in fact, in these, in these mix, language mixings, see, uh, and you know, let me quickly confess what's probably unnecessary, which is I come from, from a time when, as it were, using Hindi words in English and English words in Hindi was considered a sign of sloppiness rather than either affirmation of hierarchy or subversion. So, but having said that, I'm interested to know, one, it seems to me that when we talk about subversion, and I see the point of it, by the way, I do see the point of it, but what exactly is being subverted? Is it, is it as it were, English dominance that is being subverted? Or does the subversion actually target a certain kind of Hindi also? You know, so one is that, and the second, of course, is that in these subversions themselves, as you said, hierarchies are getting affirmed and reinforced. So, you know, so, so you have, we have, a, you know, an odd kind of subversion, which is itself hierarchical. Anyway. Thank you. More, uh, <coughs> any, anybody else or? Right, should I? Well, thank you very much, everybody. I mean, I think, um, as, I, as I said before, and I think Ravikant would agree, I think we are very much in terms of, you know, we, we erred on the, on the level of social stratification and hierarchy. So I'm a bit, you know, I don't think we should put, you know, either hierarchy in a, you know, in a total sense or, you know, unification and no hierarchy. I think we are, but, um, so obviously we recognize that language, you know, languages and varieties within languages, you know, express and reproduce hierarchy, um, certain hierarchies. But I think what we wanted to say, or um, I think what we wanted to say is that, um, I think maybe coming closer to what Alok is saying now, you know, some kind of micro, micro perhaps subversions that are directed both at the sort of larger entities of Hindi and English, you know? So rather than working at the level of the hierarchy between English and Hindi as two, you know, monoliths, uh, thinking about how particular, um, you know, how particular, of course, performed, uh, this is language mixing across media. Uh, so we are very much, uh, talking about uh, a performed and a, and a created language, um, play with these hierarchies, huh? in fact, huh? not by sort of uh, trying to assert a, 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 a lack of hierarchy or, a, or some kind of utopian, um, but, you know, destabilize or, or working at micro hierarchies within them. Huh? So when, uh, Anuja Chohani in the Zoya Factor says, uh, you know, has um, a character say, Joya ji, are up to bade admi ban ho? How are you, Madam Lucky Charm? Hmm? I think we hear an accent of English. I think we, we hear a kind of Punjabi, you know, influence on Hindi. This is supposed to be, you know, a positive character who's also a bit, you know, uh, is playing, uh, you know, economic games. So obviously we can't understand what he's doing and why this is considered a positive character within a scheme that's, that just sees English and Hindi huh? as um, you know, the two elements of her, a hierarchy. Something else is going on. Huh? Something else is going on that also is saying, oh, look, I think as you know, um, um, Avinash should put it very, very well, and I think both Patricia as well, you know, this making space within English for a certain kind of, you know, upwardly mobile vernacular type. Huh? So I think he's taking a position that says, oh, no, we are not, um, we are not this kind of pure English types who look down on all vernacular types, we make fun of them lovingly, huh? lovingly. So I think, and I think one of you also talked about, um, almost perhaps 
Aisha, a kind of variety of feelings. Uh, I think we wanted to explore this variety of feelings where, you know, I think it's often it's comedy, but it's not just a comedy of a mocking, uh, although of course there is the mocking as well going on, but a whole range of, you know, why is the, um, you know, and I talk about my own, uh, you know, my own chapter, why is the Chachi, who is a vernacular type who can, um, you know, make fun of the Gore and the Australians, is, why is she the good character as opposed to the, you know, smart, you know, the, the, um, the, the glamorous Chachi. Huh? So I think there's a kind of celebration of the vernacular type of English uh, that is made space within uh, this English genre novel. At the same time, I very much also take, uh, and I think that's why Akshay Kumar's um, chapter on Bhojpuri is so important because obviously the story of Bhojpuri, you know, how Hing English and Bhojpuri mixing works in the lollipop and uh, lagela and so on is very different from the daily you know aspirational english and i think you know we could have done much more with it um but it was a kind of this his and ratnaka tripathi were a kind of um, recognition uh, and and possibly the chatisgarhi uh chatisgar uh, sort of context in ravi ratlami that you know there's a way in which media tends to uh, center only Delhi and Bombay as where, you know, the new English is happening, but there are all these other locations where speaking Hindi only is not, you know, is not some quaint, <laughs> you know, quite quaint old fashioned, but is, is normal. Uh, I mean, I did a little bit of uh, field work in an um, English coaching institute in, in Allahabad, where the coaching institute was the only space where the young boys and girls who were preparing for, um, for um, job interviews could speak English, huh? because everywhere else where they would try to speak English, they would be made fun of. Huh? So I think this, the location of Ilabad, which I mean now counts as a small town, <laughs> like uh, <laughs> all kind of uh, cities uh, apart from the great metropolis, you know, uh, in, in this metropolitan imagination, you know, it's obviously very different. Uh, and, and, and the small, smaller towns and villages, of course, would also be very, very uh, different. So I think my point would be that we are trying, we're not trying to say, oh, there's no hierarchy, but trying to sort of, uh, um, introduce smaller gradations and, and different positions of within the hierarchies. And I think, I mean, and this is a point that to me became, became so clear about, um, you know, while doing this book and talking to, uh, to the contributors is that, uh, you know, often when we think of Indian English, then English is the global English uh, or the in English as the foreign language or English as the unmarked, you know, colonial language for example, British English, but English seems to come very much with this kind of centering and making mainstreaming of Indian English. Huh? So that, um, and what does that mean? I think also, of course, has different, different meanings and different connotations, uh, but so huh? it's multiple Hindi, multiple English. Um, yeah. And also the reason why we focused on, on media was I think because the majority of um, studies of code, code mixing and code switching tend to be about ordinary language, no spoken language and this sort of micro, micro studies. And we thought that those, as, uh, as Aisha uh, said at the beginning, those tend to then leave the macro and the social meanings and the media meanings in very broad categories. Huh? And I think we wanted instead to, again, put the media um, and the manipulated language and this creative, you know, this compressed or, or charged language of English in advertising, in newspapers, in nowhere, as, as, as Vinit says, you know, English in FM is not the natural, you know, the spontaneous English, it's continuously pushed for. Huh? Why is it continuously pushed for? Huh? No, no, let's try to have more English. Huh? What, what does that mean? What, and so these were all the questions that we, we had and we tried to explore in the book without again just saying, oh, English in media has this meaning, huh? but trying to do more the, the micro studies to which of course much more can be 
can and should be added. And I particularly like the idea of, you know, where is this leading to? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the anxiety, and, and I think, you know, Rohit Prakash's article and, and Ratnaka Tripathi are very much about the anxiety, the Hingvi anxiety. We also had in the, in the workshops, the anxiety of the teachers. Huh? I mean, it's all very well celebrating English as a unifying force, but what happens to children or college students who cannot write a sentence in one language huh? without putting words in another one, in the other language? Huh? Is this something to be celebrated or is this something to be worried about? Huh? So um, I definitely, you know, I think we definitely We see it as you know hierarchies within hierarchies, subversion within hierarchies, hierarchies within subversion, and so on and so forth. I I just wanted to make a comment about um, um, well a couple of things, but I'll be very brief. I think that um, one thing that you know when we look at the prehistories, if you want, but they're not prehistories. Uh, recent histories of languages like Hindi, there are two aspects that uh, need to be, um, you know, the Hindi that we saw, you know, the one, the Hindi that uh, Alok referred to or from generations before this, uh, let's say, so if you look at the Hindi generations from maybe the 40s uh, with the workings of the Central Hindi um, Commission and up to the 90s liberalization, you're seeing a Hindi that got used and was officially presented as a Hindi that was not lexified by other stocks. So that it was one that had done a purge. And so the uh, insurrection of uh, market-driven uh, code mixing is the fact that it is not a relaxation. It doesn't admit back Urdu words into it. It's not a relaxation of that norm, right, of borrowing. Whereas when you look at, you know, literature in both Hindi and Urdu from the 40s, 30s, 40s, there is free borrowing from English. So that I think that we have to make a distinction. It's a particular problem of Hindi. And that the code mixing that is allowed now and which is seen as a give space, is ideologically loaded to maintain the exclusionary property of Hindi to not displace it too much. And that's what makes this whole phenomenon interesting that the market trumps that. And so you don't have, you can borrow English affixes, right? And you can stick them onto words like English Tani. <laughs> But I don't think that anybody's going to coin a bay adjective anymore. So I think that that history, immediate history that we need to think of, and that's when you see fun and play, et cetera. It's a very specific history of Hindi. <clears throat> and I suppose that goes back to Alok's point about the subversion of that Hindi, no? that particularly, you know, should the normative Hindi, but as you're right, without without going in the direction of Hindustani, yeah. I see very happy faces. Uh, I don't know if any of the countries are actually your uniforms or the designs of your identity. This is our celebration of our book. Thank you, uh, Aisha ji and Trisha ji and Avinash ji for wonderful interventions. But it's quite clear, right, that uh, uh, people are not really bothered about English uh, the way they were at once, at one point of time. Uh, it doesn't really, you know, uh, rattle us anymore. It uh, rattles the Biharis even less. Uh, and I'm addressing Alok here. Uh, क्योंकि इलाहाबाद वाले तो शुद्ध वाले होते ही हैं 
लेकिन उधर इलाहाबाद से थोड़ा उधर बढ़ने के बाद नो आई थिंक लार्जर लार्जर थिंग दैट नीड्स टू बी रिकॉग्नाइज्ड अपार्ट फ्रॉम द ऑफ कोर्स देर सिचुएशंस वेर वी वी कैन रीड पावर एंड देर सिचुएशंस वेर वी कैन नॉट रीड पावर बट इज देर अ पावर स्टोरी इन इन अ लार्जर यू नो हिस्टोरिकल सेंस when kabir was saying that uh, bhasha bahta neer is there a you know socio linguistic point that he is trying to make or not uh, so or if you know certain languages uh, grow in spite of all the policing and all the controlling and all the uh, uh, you know uh, grammar uh, grammar etc etc there must be something you know about uh, the way people uh, uh, use language and therefore each person actually has one's unique language right which is a mixture of so many things so mixing is the norm is what i would say it's not natural one can read it you know all kinds of hegemony stories there and also counter hegemony stories there but i think the the, the language story is far more complicated than to be you know ideologically reduced to this or that and one of the one of the things that we are trying to do here is that that i wish you know it took, it could be so simple ideologically it's not as akriti also you know is trying to struggle with the divya prakash dube phenomenon and whether it is you know patriotic or whether it is redefining the patriotic and trying to reclaim a space that is being taken away because there is a role model there is an ideal hindi right shuddh hindi alok ilahabadi hindi right against which there is this fun and frolic and of course defiance uh, all of that is there but it's also uh, it's also kind of a assertion uh, sazana jaydev's essay for example you know that one person can have different domains and different registers of the same language and 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 uh, and the humiliation stories and then trying to recover from those humiliation all of that is part of a socialization we our effort was to capture these you know whatever is available in various media registers to take it seriously and to say perhaps francesca would agree with me to say that look english is here to stay enjoy it because there are so many people who are enjoying it that is a how languages have always been and grown uh, of course sorry there, there would be this is a very uh, you know it's a it's a generalization and i'm sure you can quarrel with me okay you are excited ritu ji So actually most of my questions have been asked by Avinash but I just on your reaction is uh, I mean your statement um so is it that the book is about that the language is um, english is about still uh, shared emotion it's still a collective identity aspiration i mean despite seeing the multiplicity despite seeing the variations as been talked about and i'm sure i have not read the book i'm really sorry for that so i'm not sure but just that as you were putting it that you are not going into ideologies of it not do not want to go into the seriousness or the you know the what are the manifestations further but um, so overall the is it so that the book is stating that um, it's a collective shared emotion which is now shared and there is also a sense of um, uh, we the people of india is it like that like so no i don't think so no i don't think uh, we are making any kind of uh, generalizing statement because i mean that then would be putting one one meaning no and and one label to what english is whereas ex- what we are going to do is exactly the opposite no to say not just that there are many forms but they carry very different meanings so 
Uh, and, and the interesting thing is exactly that they can be opposite meanings. No? So it can be subversive or it can be, you know, uh, instead uh, enforcing a new or, or sort of establishing a new hierarchy or, you know, it can be patriotic, it can be, you know, anti, anti-English itself, huh? the Bhojpuri English mean. So I think we are, we are resisting, uh, we are resisting one um, definition, not because we are sloppy and we are lazy and because, <laughs> but because we think, no, because I think that would be go against exactly against the, the logic of the phenomenon that we are describing, no? And, uh, and also um, against the attempts to say, oh, English means this, no? English is only the language of, you know, metropolitan youth when they meet in, in colleges and, you know, it's this unifying language. And I think it's, you know, what Trisha said about, you know, what it meant in, uh, you know, in when any gives to those ones. It's so interesting, isn't it? That then there is some kind of, you know, elite uh, lingo uh, of, of English, um, Whereas, you know, 20 years later, you know, you have people saying, oh, this is the kind of uh, language that brings students of Delhi in Delhi University from all parts of the country together. Hmm? Of course, you know, if we were linguists and we did the kind of exact um, description and analysis of the micro, you know, the, uh, then probably we would also see difference that, you know, again, it's not just the same language. Uh, but still, huh? I think that was a really powerful counterexample for me. Mm. Mm-hmm. And Kartik also. In the modern days, uh, in the days of WhatsApp uh, and you know signals, and the younger generation communicating, if you ever heard them, you know, uh, the of, uh, and you you understand that English is the language they use. Like, let's go for a deco. If they have to go to a market to have a to do some window shopping, it's, let's go for a deco. And recently, somebody just sent me a message: uh, uh, "Callu, should I call?" <laughs> so, <laughs> and the person is a very senior person. I mean, he's he must be 58, 59. And then I realized that okay, so it's not that you know it's only the younger ones who are uh, you know English I is. It's everyone who has been who's on the digital platform is Englishized. That's what I, it's just a small comment that I want to make. And I think one point that we haven't touched is also script, no? So how much the Roman script is part of the, uh, Roman script is part of the equation. Hmm? And so tolerance included in increased tolerance and, and some preference. Huh? So I had a small comment on a very tangential <laughs> observation that you made, which was about teaching. So, this sense of hierarchy and subversion and play within mixed languages or how does that one distinguish that from a sense of hierarchy which comes when you say tuti puti bhasha which clearly indicates an inadequacy rather than this ability to mix whether that has some bearing on how you can imagine possible pedagogy I mean, it was very interesting. We couldn't unfortunately make it part of the of the volume, but we had an interesting discussion on education and classroom in the in the workshop here, uh, which I mean, with the uh, teachers um, saying that you know they find the tutti putti bhasha both in the English language schools and in the Hindi medium schools, and basically that you couldn't have a class a class. You know, you couldn't have a Hindi class within English, and you couldn't have an English class within without Hindi. So, you know, again, making it, I mean, I think what we are trying also to say is that this is not just a question of or Hindi speakers who are trying, you know, to include as much English as they can, but they don't really have the, the you know, the, the resources. Uh, so they're, they're lacking something, which is, I, I don't know, I suppose that English, English, you no know, film. Um, but it's also, you know, Hing- English, uh, it's a situation of English mm-hmm. classrooms and, um, and pedagogy. Huh? And I think the only person who said, oh, well, you know, you can have very good, uh, you know, instead full bilingual control is if you start with, uh, you know, Hindi or whatever your, you know, mother or regional tongue language is, and then include English later, which is, is exactly the kind of the situation that is not happening <laughs> so you know the 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 the, um, uh, 
the strategy that would lead to greater bilingualism is the strategy that is not being followed, huh? either in English schools or in Hindi schools. So what do you do then? Huh? I think we come back to, to um, Ravi Khan's point about, you know, existing uh, reality as opposed to, you know, how we would like it to, to be. Hmm. Uh, mera bas thoda sa matlab mera apne personal experience hai maine abhi kitab to nahi padhi hai uh, lekin jaise abhi uh, ye jo puri english hai zahir si baat hai advertisements cinema aur uh, ye jo radio hai fm channels ye aaj matlab isko zyada produce kar rahe hai lekin ek taraf ye bhi hai ki yahi multiplexes bahut sari audience ko cinema se bahar kar chuka hai टीवी भी अब मतलब लोग पता नहीं कितना एडवर्टीजमेंट्स पे भी ध्यान देते हैं वो ज्यादा पोलराइज हो चुका है और उसमें तरह तरह की और दूसरी चीजें लोग देखते हैं नो uh, डाउट no हिंदी एडॉप्ट uh, करती रही है बहुत सारी चीजों को जैसा कि सभी स्पीकर्स uh, ने भी इस बात को मेंशन किया ही है कि तरह तरह की हिंदी है uh, एक मोहल्ले में भी थोड़ा सा मतलब इधर उधर हो जाइए तो वहां भी बदल जाता है ठीक है और इंग्लिश uh, में लोग मतलब एक क्या ये uh, uh, अब किसी को इंग्लिश नहीं आती है तो वो इंग्लिश बोलने का प्रयास करता है हमने आमतौर पे अपने एक्सपीरियंसेस से भी हम जानते हैं कि हमारे यहाँ लोग अपने बेटे को भी कह सकते हैं डोंट डू दिस और अपने डॉगी uh, को भी कह सकते हैं डोंट डू दिस या रॉकी uh, ईट इस तरह के इंग्लिश लोग इस्तेमाल करते हैं तो ये क्या इंग्लिश uh, ना आने से उपजा एक एक हीन भावना है जो उसको इंग्लिश से वो इंग्लिश की तरफ बढ़ना चाहता है और दूसरा ये कि ये भी हमने देखा है कि जैसे अभी कुछ दिनों पहले एक हिंदी का स्टैंड अप कॉमेडी काफ़ी वायरल हुआ था जो बेसिकली यहाँ के आई एन ए मार्केट को लेकर के था कि ब्रदर टी शर्ट पीछे से आके कहता है तो वो लोग भी ये क्या कम्युनिकेट करने की कोशिश कर रहा है या उसके अंदर की कोई जो है आ, कोई ग्रंथी है जो उसको इस तरह से बात करने के लिए मजबूर कर रही है तो इस ये कुछ है मेरे टोटे फोटे से थैंक यू हाय सॉरी वेरी डिफरेंट क्वेश्चन बट आल्सो आई वांटेड टू आस्क इफ देयर सम मे बी मे बी इट्स इन द बुक आल्सो सम डिस्कशन ऑफ the gendered aspect of the languages also because i, I remember i discussed it with a friend also about how he uses hindi more often to assert his masculinity in some sense and also this mixing happens in such a way because in the queer community uh english is used english is used in a way to again assert someone's sex/gender identity in different ways i remember when i was yeah when i was interviewing a group of trans people this this question came up about how they used language as well and so this question of moving also between hindi and english also has a gendered aspect in some sense and i wanted to ask about that and whether that's something that koi aur jawab ha ha thank you for such a wonderful discussion uh, मेरे एक सिंपल सी क्वेरी है मेरी कि जब भी हम बात करते हैं इंग्लिश की जैसे डिस्कशन में भी समझ में आया कि वो एज एक एक प्रोसेस की जर्नी में है जिसमें जो है वो दोनों चीज़ों को ही मतलब दोनों ही लैंग्वेजेस जो है अपने आप को यूज कर रही है मतलब तो मेरा जो सवाल है वो ये है कि एज ए जर्नी जो दोनों ही लैंग्वेजेस एक्सपीरियंस कर रही है उसमें जो है आ, कैसे जो है ये दोनों लैंग्वेजेस एक दूसरे का यूज कर रही है एक तो मुझे मतलब ये थोड़ा सा समझना है और दूसरी चीज ये कि इस जो मिक्सिंग है इसमें आ, क्योंकि एज ए पॉलिटिकल साइंस स्टूडेंट मेरा फोकस इस चीज पर है कि कैसे जो है उसमें जो फॉर्म ऑफ डोमिनेशन है और कि एक को जो है मतलब इन दोनों लैंग्वेजेस में किस भाषा का स्तर जो है एक मतलब सुपीरियर है और दूसरा जो है इन्फीरियर है या फिर ये कॉन्टेक्स्ट के हिसाब से या एरिया के हिसाब से जो है वो चेंज हो रहा है तो मुझे इसके थोड़ी सी जानकारी चाहिए 
बस आखिरी एक दो बातें बड़े सवाल हैं कुछ और हम कुछ इशारे कर पाए हैं किताब में और कुछ फॉर एग्जांपल दिस क्वेश्चन अबाउट ट्रांसजेंडर एंड जेंडर एंड लैंग्वेज इज अ बिग क्वेश्चन एंड वंस अगेन आई वुड से दैट देर आर वेरिएशंस अक्रॉस अक्रॉस द यू नो द रीजन्स अक्रॉस टाइम्स एंड आल्सो डिपेंड्स ऑन you know how urban is this movement that we are talking about uh do we uh, do we have possibilities for other registers in other regions uh depends we will have to get some more data to be able to say with uh, but i think there is a uh, you know wonderful hint there and i i quite understand why uh, you know a kind of particular pure masculine hindi is the way it is seen as you know uh, there there is a there is a history to that uh, language which alok rai has written about and uh, now it's available in hindi but it is his hindi uh, and not uh, the himadri tung shring se prabuddh shuddh bharati wali hindi so uh, alok had also asked this way you know complicated question can we actually have sad songs in english in one of the workshops i think we are getting there not yet but uh, yes for example breakup song is a breakup song but it's a it's a song about a new context and it's also trying to subvert the idea of breakup and devdas like kind of condition after the breakup right no we are not going to cry like our ancestors did right that was the tragedy king and tragedy queen days right so we have moved on and we'll we'll cry in english also that's what i also try to suggest uh domination uh yes uh, depends if you feel bad you know if you feel uh, if you feel always if you always feel inferior about hindi versus english uh, then you will say ki nahi ye to hindi ke ilake mein angrezi ki pat hai aur angrezi hindi ko maar raha hai isko aap aise bhi dekh sakte hai ki angrezi mein hindi bhi to ja rahi hai और अंग्रेजी में जब हिंदी घुसती है तो अंग्रेजी वालों को परेशानी क्यों नहीं होती है इतनी दैट इज यू नो दैट इज अ क्वेश्चन वी नीड टू आस्क एंड इट इज अ क्वेश्चन ऑफ कोर्स अंग्रेजी हिंदी में वर्चस्व की लड़ाई भी है झगड़े की भी लड़ाई है लेकिन जैसा कि कई लोगों ने कहा है सत्ता सिर्फ अंग्रेजी के पास ही नहीं है सत्ता हिंदी के पास भी डिपेंड करता है किस संदर्भ में जैसे अगर हमारी मघी से आप उसको उसकी तुलना करेंगे तो जाहिर है हिंदी के पास सकता है तो बदलती हुई स्थिति है और बदलता मतलब मेरे पास सारे सवालों का जवाब नहीं वो जो अविनाश ने कहा था कि कि उसके एंटीसीडेंट्स को ट्रेस करने की जरूरत है और वो है कैथी हैंसन का जो की जो पीएचडी है उदाहरण के तौर पर रेणु पर और एक जो पूरा लेख है कि रेणु में किस तरह की इंग्लिश आती है और हिंदियाइज होकर के आती है या तदभवाइज होकर के आती है उस पर बहुत खूबसूरती से लिखा है उन्होंने और जोशी जी तो तुम्हारे हमारे और संजीव और कई लोगों के प्रिय है सारे तुम प्रवीण यहीं पूछ लोगे सवाल ठीक है आखिरी सवाल है इसके बाद बिल बिल क्लोज है चेयर इज सेइंग नीचे चल गए Precisely precisely my point that that you mentioned the the last thing that of course Hindi Hindi is also traveling to English, but when English to 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 English 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 but when I see as a departure English is coming to Hindi land. Base is coming base it remain part of in in some sort of a, in a very diff, different form creolization but when Hindi goes to English, it became italic panchayat became council and then you have to explain what what does it mean so in that way it is it is happening the other way it's not happening the way hindi is adapting if i may uh, the way hindi is adapting english but when it the hindi goes to the english it remains in italic form so i was think my question was like how, what do we do when this thing is inform the other side of the story like okay the hindi is going but in a civilization is improvisation <laughs> <laughs> that is my you know counter question why look at it like that it also creates an identity right you stand out in that whole life just one word right no depends why why one has to really look at it from all angles
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think anybody oh. who's been in school, English schools, I think knows that there are lots of purges in English as well. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for your questions and for coming and for staying. And